If you've got friends that have checked out on the Brewer season already or, oh, it's over, they're done after that series of the Reds and the Pirates and everything that went down a couple weeks ago, oh, they, it's over, it's over. What are they saying now? Huh? Split with the best team in baseball, had a chance to win all four games, played really, really good, complete baseball the, to get the split. Bullpen was great. Corbin Burns was Corbin Burns for the most part. This is the team that we know is in there. The Brewers are playing well. They got to take that momentum into the weekend. Cubs this afternoon. Get ready. Got to keep the the energy high and the morale high. There's a lot of season to go, but it's starting to count now. You're locked on. You are locked on Brewers. Your daily Milwaukee Brewers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Brewers are 5-3 winners last night over the Dodgers. What a game to split the series. Two games apiece. Now, they're not done yet. They see the Dodgers again on Monday. A three-game series out at Dodger Stadium coming up. So that's still on the horizon. But tonight, or I should say this afternoon, one twenty first pitch down at Wrigley. If you want to say it's a trap series, fine, whatever. But this is a series that the Brewers need to show and throw their weight around a little bit and prove that they are the better team on the field and on paper Big weekend upcoming with those rivals down I-94. I'm Dominic Catronio. This is Locked On Brewers, your only daily podcast Monday through Friday, dedicated to the Brew Crew all season long. I'm the post-game host on 620 WTMJ and the statistician for Valley Sports Wisconsin. Uh, by the time you're listening to this, I'm probably on train headed down the Wrigley right now. I'll be there all weekend long. Stoked to get back down there. I haven't been there yet this season, so it's been a little bit for me. I'm re- really, really excited to get back down to the friendly confines and... Uh, You know, just enjoy some baseball. Should be a fun weekend. Hopefully we stay dry, of course. But we're going to talk about this big win. Uh, I want to talk about three players that I think are going to make the difference down the stretch that aren't named Corbin Burns or Devin Williams. Uh, And I also want to just look ahead to the weekend and give some overall thoughts as we get ready for uh, the Cubbies coming up starting today. Quick quick, uh, note here, of course, no episode tomorrow or Sunday. So let's head into your weekend with the standings check right now. Here in the Central... Cardinals won again yesterday. They are now three games up still on the Brewers. Brewers are 63 and 54. The Cardinals are 66 and 51. As for the wild card race, the Brewers are still on the outside looking in. Atlanta leads the way. They're seven games clear of Philadelphia, who's a half game clear of San Diego. The Brewers are currently a game and a half back of the Padres at the time of recording. Uh, the Padres playing West Coast game last night. It's one to one right now in the bottom of the six, and that game's taking forever. So I just wanted to record and get to bed. Uh, so it could be either a game back if the Padres end up losing, or still two games back if the Padres end up winning. It doesn't matter. Nonetheless, the Brewers are 63 and 54, 117 games down, only 45 to go. It's going to be over in the blink of an eye here. So they are still time. But there needs to be a little bit of urgency. The Mets are still leading in the East. Uh, They just lost three out of four to the Braves, though. Cardinals, as we mentioned, in the the Central. And the Dodgers are running away with the West. Did you know the Dodgers have only lost 36 games? That's just a wild number to look at in person. When I look at this standings, and when I look at this, and then we'll get into the recap here in just a second, I still see a very tough schedule upcoming for San Diego. Yes, they're playing the Nationals right now, and there's some juice happening with Josh Bell and with Juan Soto in that regard. But mind you, have you noticed what Josh Bell has done since he moved to the Padres? He hasn't done much. Uh, Just keep an eye on that. I don't think it's going to last all year, but just keep an eye on that. So they're playing Washington right now. They've got this series all weekend, a four-game set with the Nats. They got two with Cleveland. Kansas City will be an easier opponent. San Francisco, who knows what to make of them right now. They got shut out by the Diamondbacks yesterday. But then they got their first three games of their final nine against the Dodgers. September, it starts to get a little tougher on them. In September, they get three with the Dodgers, three with the Diamondbacks, three with the Dodgers. And I say the Diamondbacks because they're playing good baseball right now. Zach Gallon's throwing 22 consecutive scoreless innings. Carson Kelly's been legit. UW-Milwaukee star Dalton Varsho has been legit. Diamondbacks are not going to be a rollover team. They've got two with Seattle. They've got three with St. Louis. Uh, they got three more with the Dodgers. they got three more with the White Sox at the very end of uh, at the start of October. 
it's not going to end easy for the Padres. I'm going to keep keeping an eye on what they got going on here down the stretch because it is scoreboard watching season. As for these Cardinals, they are heading out west. They are taking on the Diamondbacks coming up this weekend. As I mentioned, they've been playing good baseball, but they do get to miss Zach Gallen in that series. Now, that's enough for the standings and a quick schedule update. Brewers win 5-3. to three. Another extremely well-pitched, tight contest. Brewers were up 5 nothing at one point. A weird sixth inning made things tight, and then the bullpen locked things down. Biggest stat for me from this game, not the pair of home runs by Andrew McCutcheon, not the 3-for-3 three three day by Hunter Renfro. It was the Brewers bullpen going 3 and a third scoreless with six strikeouts and only two walks and zero hits. It was a huge day for Brad Boxberger. He was asked to get the final out of the sixth inning with the Dodgers offense waking up and rolling. He gets the final out of that sixth inning. He quiets the woes that he's had with inherited runners and overall here in the last couple of weeks. So Boxberger does his role, faces two batters. He allowed a walk, but he also got a strikeout. Taylor Rogers, a seven-pitch seventh inning. Huge bounce back series for him against the team that has seen him already this season. That was encouraging from Taylor Rogers. Matt Bush throwing gas, nasty curveball. That was great to see. And then, of course, Devin freaking Williams. Three batters, three strikeouts, all three strikeouts on fastballs. When Devin's working with the fastball, he did use the changeup here and there. He got swings and misses on it. It was more of a show me type pitch, I think, in yesterday's game for Devin than it was an actual. Hey, I'm trying to get you out with this changeup. He had he had five whiffs, three of them on the fastball on all those strikeouts, two of them on the changeup, and he didn't throw a single changeup with a two strike count. So he's using and trusting his fastball now. I love watching him in the closer role. He's able to use all that energy and to use his absolute incredible fiery personality. And I I've said this point yesterday on Brewers Weekly on WTMJ. I know we talk a lot about the quotes he made and the awkwardness of the interview after the Josh Hader trade in Pittsburgh. We've all seen the memes by now, but I look at it in a different way. I think it's starting to settle in now on Devin that, yes, it sucks to lose your best friend, and it sucks to see the business side of baseball. But in the same time, that move was a compliment to Devin Williams in a belief saying, we think you're the guy. We think you can do this. We think you can be the closer in the ninth inning. He has that perfect personality for it. And I know Craig Council said we're going to play it by committee. We're going to play it by ear. Maybe there will be days where it's more important for Devin to pitch in the eighth inning as opposed to the ninth inning, the way that the lineup shakes up. That could still happen. But in my opinion, Devin Williams gives you the best chance to win in the ninth inning. In my opinion, he has been just as automatic as Josh Hader, if not more automatic, especially since he righted his ship in mid in mid May, yes, he allowed the run, the walk off homer to Brian Reynolds. The the unearned runs against Cincinnati, I'm not mad about. That was a defensive miscue. That was not his fault. He did his job. What I look at with Devin Williams, he has been a workhorse. And something I was very interesting to watch develop that almost happened in yesterday's game. Devin was actually up and throwing and ready to enter in the eighth inning if Matt Bush ran into more trouble. When was the last time we saw a Brewers closer? Go for a four-out save. We haven't seen that since Josh Hader in 2019. And then it was came across, hey, well, I'm not doing that anymore. I feel like I'm only effective in one inning. Devin was saying, all right, I'll get up. Keep an eye on that. That might show its head a little bit later on in the season if he needs to get more than three outs on a save if Craig Council feels comfortable putting Devin Williams into the game. Uh, let's get into the recap now as the Brewers win by a final of 5-4. to four. Before we jump in, I want to tell you about one of our newest sponsors. The liver is the body's metabolic furnace. It helps you keep a steady weight. It's responsible for flushing out harmful toxins and igniting your fat-burning metabolism. But right now in modern diets, they have unhealthy processed foods and constant exposure to thousands of man-made environmental toxins means that your liver is probably overworked. And of course, other reasons have to do with that as well. You can rejuvenate your liver health and reignite your metabolism thanks to the Liver Health Formula by Pure Health Research. This formula contains eight liver-boosting supernutrients like turmeric, beet, and artichoke extract. No more bloated belly, no more uncomfortable digestion moments, no more feeling tired and low on energy all the time. And the Liver Health Formula makes it easier to maintain a healthy body weight long-term. 
If you want to try the Liver Health Formula risk-free today, you're going to get a free bottle of Curb Fit with your order, which is an appetite suppressant. It's all natural, making it easier to say no to the foods that you know you're not supposed to eat. So go to getliverhelp.com slash MLB to learn more. Again, getliverhelp.com slash MLB to try the Liver Health Formula completely risk-free and claim your free bottle of Curb Fit with your order. Recap, Brewers. They got out to a hot start in this one. Andrew Heaney, look, he looked really darn good today. Brewers had no answer for the slider, and he's left-handed. The Brewers have had their struggles with left-handers. He had 10 strikeouts, which was one shy of a season high for him this season. He had a ton of whiffs, a new season high in whiffs. He had 19 total, but he did allow three home runs in this game. And the first one, off the bat of Andrew McCutcheon with two strikes and two outs in the first inning. He That's exactly what Andrew McCutcheon was brought here to do. Hit left-handed pitching. He ends up going two for four in this game with the pair of home runs. More on the second a little bit later. But I'm pulling up his splits right now. It quite hasn't been the giant split that you would have maybe expected. Especially given he's actually technically having a worse batting average against lefties than he does against righties. But he does have a better slugging and OPS against lefties. I think part of that has to do with the lack of at-bats. The Brewers have barely faced lefties this year. And then it seems like anytime they do, it's a stretch of like three or, you know, three and five days kind of thing, like we saw this week. Kutch is hitting 241 against lefties, 257 against righties, but his OPS is a little over 100 points better. 802 versus lefties, 699 against righties. And McCutcheon hitting two home runs off of a lefty today was really the story of it, in my opinion, for the reason why the Brewers won this game. Moving along now, so a solo homer in the first inning. Andrew McCutcheon back up in the third inning. Two-run shot. It scores Christian, it scores Christian Yelich, who managed a single earlier in that inning. So it's 3-0 Brewers. Corbin Burns is on the mound. Morale is high. Everybody is excited. Corbin Burns was on early. He was dotting backdoor cutters. He was using his entire repertoire. Corbin ended up throwing 103 pitches today. 61 cutters. 44 of them were strikes. So better than we've seen as of late with the strike rate with the cutter. 72% of his cutters were strikes. We talk about his cutter command being the key for him and how you can know if he's on, if the cutter is there. Another thing that we saw in this game, he didn't really use the slider. He didn't really show many sinkers at all either. It was really all cutters and curveballs and a few changes sprinkled in there too. The curveball I thought was fantastic and I thought he shied away from it in the sixth inning, but Corbin was pitching really well for five innings. He was on a roll, but more on that in just a little bit. 3 nothing Brewers, thanks to two homers by Andrew McCutcheon. We fast forward now to the bottom of the fifth inning. Uh, this inning started inauspiciously, a ground out, or a strikeout by Christian Yelich, a ground out by Willie Adamas. But then, Andrew McCutcheon reaches on a strikeout past ball. So it puts him on first. The inning, in Andrew Heaney's eyes, is essentially over. Now he's got to face Hunter Renfro. And on the sixth pitch of his at-bat, a no-doubt blast to center field. It scores Kutch, makes it 5 nothing Brewers with Corbin Burns on the mound. Psh! Pack it up. Let's go home. He's dominating. This is a great day. And then everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. You know, So it happened fast on Corbin Burns. That top of the sixth inning, I'm not one to rag on umpires. I'm really not. I hate doing it. But this was a bad week of umpiring. And right before the double to Trey Turner, I thought he was rung up. I don't always pay attention to the strike zone box. I think that's not quite properly augmented and that's not a Bally sports problem that's not a stat cast problem that's just the technology I, I think we use it too much and we rely on it too much I thought that was a strike Corbin Burns deserves to get that strike instead it gives up a double off the wall by Trey Turner and then everything kind of changed from there on the ninth pitch of an at-bat to Freddie Freeman he manages a single up the middle it puts runners on the corners and nobody out meat of the order coming up and Will Smith attacks early. He manages a single into center field. It scores a run. It puts runners on first and second. Burns is suddenly grinding, but hey, all right. You know, nobody out, first and second. Up by four still. Nothing to worry about. Muncie strikes out. Then Turner lines out to right. And Freeman did not try to tag from second base. Okay, yeah, you, you know, it's Corbin Burns. He'll get through six. He'll be fine. And then almost the epic play of the year. Gavin Lux, man, what a series for him coming back home. He rockets one to straightaway center field. Tyrone Taylor is racing back to right center, trying to make an epic leaping catch. He actually had it in the glove, brought it back from over the wall, but he brought it back so fast, and it slipped out of his glove 
while it was in the palm. It slipped out. Instead of it being a homer, it was a triple. It scored two runs. And all of a sudden, it's a two-run game. The tying run is coming to the plate and some loud contact in that sixth inning off of Corbin Burns. It happened in the blink of an eye. But man, Tyrone Taylor, that would have been incredible. That would have let off the show. Uh, Wow. He's really gotten better. B.A. and Rock made this observation on television. Like He has gotten better at going back on a ball. He's not giving up on balls at the wall anymore. Maybe that robbery against the Rays last Tuesday inspired him a little bit to go up and get some balls a little more instead of playing the wall and playing the carom more often than not. And he nearly got one there. So keep that in your back pocket. He may think about pulling that out again later on in the season. But for Corbin Burns, what I look at with Corbin, he's normally been decent the third time through the order. It hasn't been a a massive issue for him. Look, everybody struggles a third time through a batting order. That's It's always hard to get big league hitters out three consecutive times. But looking at his splits this season, this is not including yesterday's game, but you look at it the first time through, the second time through, and the third time through. First time through, opponents hitting 156. Second time through, opponents hitting 178. Third time through, opponents only hitting 209. So there wasn't quite a cause for an alarm to think, oh, he's facing a third time through, but it's Corbin Burns. You thought he was going to get through it. But then you remember, oh, It's the Dodgers. (laughs) They're really darn good. I'm not mad about it. Sometimes teams figure you out, and he was was shying away from that cutter in that sixth inning after the one that didn't get called against Trey Turner and then the double. And Look, a weird sixth inning, uh, Tyrone with a crazy play, then Brad Boxberger comes in. He allows a walk, but then gets the key strikeout against Chris Taylor. Uh, Great job by him to exercise some demons as of late. And then from there, the bullpen's had it in. Really no sweat the rest of the way. Uh, Taylor Rogers, Matt Bush, Devin Williams, they did their jobs. Brewers really struggled against the Dodgers' bullpen, which keep that in mind for next week's series. Try to get to the starters as early as you can, and you're probably going to face a pretty similar rotation coming up next week against Los Angeles. As it's penciled in right now, Eric Lauer will get the start on Monday, which would like likely mean that you're probably going to get another matchup with either a Ryan Pepio or maybe even uh, maybe you put uh, somebody else coming off the IL from there. But then you got Pepio, let's say, on Monday. You'll probably have a rematch of Burns versus Heaney on Tuesday. Uh, and then Wednesday you could have perhaps Ashby, perhaps if Kershaw's coming back, maybe you'll have Anderson. There's a lot of ways that the Dodgers can go with that. But you're going to see these guys again. Don't be gloating too hard right now, but... It's a good win, and it's a good series win, or a series split, I should say, because it feels like a win. And if you want to say, oh, well, how how low is the bar that they're they're celebrating series splits? It's the Dodgers. They're the preseason favorites. They're a complete team. They have more money in the world to spend. They have more money when David Price is into the game and Freddie Freeman's at first base than the Brewers have pretty much in their entire starting lineup. Right? They have an advantage that most teams don't have. And quite frankly, somebody asked me yesterday in the press box, do you think the Dodgers can win the World Series? And I said, no. They're a good team, but I don't think they can because we don't know what's going on with Clayton Kershaw's back. We think we know he'll be back at some point, but can you rely on him in the postseason? What if his back freezes up in the DS? And then you're going to be relying on young arms and Urias and Gonsolin and Anderson, since now you know Walker Bueller is out. And they need some help on the pitching side. Dustin May's on his way back, but he's going to be on an innings limit. They're going to be in a weird spot relying on their bullpen a lot harder than what the Brewers would be if they make the postseason. And it also leads me to my next point. This series was an exact example of what good pitching does to good hitting. Monday, the Brewers only allowed three earned runs. Tuesday, in 11 innings, they only allowed three earned runs. Wednesday, they only allowed two earned runs. And then yesterday, they only allowed three earned runs against the Dodgers. People want to complain about the Brewers getting neutralized by good pitching and like, oh, this is what you're going to see in the playoffs. But their good pitching just neutralized one of the best offenses in all of baseball. It works both ways. You have to recognize when the Brewers are doing it to a very good lineup on the other side. Also, shout out to David Roberts. Thanks for giving Mookie Betts the day off yesterday. That might have been huge. I laughed at the shot that Bally Sports Wisconsin showed when they saw Mookie Betts Hanging out in the dugout in that ninth inning. Hey, I wonder if Mookie Betts is going to pinch hit. Oh, nope. He's right there chilling in the hoodie and his sunglasses on. He ain't coming in. 
Thanks for that. I don't know if you would have made all the difference in the world, but thanks for that. Brewers, this split, if you want to say the bar is too low to be celebrating a split, I think you're wrong because you needed to show life. And we talked about at the start of this stretch that you're facing seven games against the Dodgers. You would be thrilled with a three and four record against the Dodgers. You were mentally ready for a two and five record against the Dodgers. And what I had said is that the Brewers can go in this stretch of seven with the Dodgers and three with the Cubs. If the Brewers can find a way, if they go two and five against the Dodgers and then go two and one against the Cubs, okay, well, that's four and six. That's not bad. Then if you win another series on the back end of that against Chicago, that's six and seven. But now you start to think, okay, well, they went two and two in this first half. They should win the series against the Cubs. So that makes it four and three. And then if they steal a series on the road from Los Angeles, oh, wait a minute. That's... That's a six and four stretch against a first place team and a team that's had your number this year. Season's far from over. This is the series that you're going to learn what the Brewers are made of. They're getting healthy. The bullpen is just about ready to go. They're going to have the young guns going this weekend down at Wrigley. You got Aaron Ashby going today, Freddie Peralta going tomorrow, and then Big Woo will close it out on Sunday. So got a good setup of pitching let's talk more about this series coming up before we do that if you're thinking about getting some action if you're driving down to illinois you know what that means sports gambling is legal down there betonline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs you can find your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds lines and games you can find reviews and news of every single league of course nfl right around the corner Uh, Packers are playing tonight, if I'm not mistaken, against the uh, Saints. So that would be interesting as well. I'm pulling up Ben Online right now to look ahead at what they say for tomorrow with the Cubs starting Keegan Thompson, a righty against Aaron Ashby. Brewers are favored in the money line, minus 135. They don't have a run line up yet, which I think is kind of odd. But that Brewers are favored, as you would expect. Aaron Ashby, he had a dominating performance against them earlier in the season. See if he can tap into that well again here coming up. Today, 121st pitch. But if you want any more information on that, betonline.net is where the game starts. So Ashby, this is going to be a a gut check game for Aaron Ashby, in my opinion. This is, it's still wild to think that Aaron Ashby has only made 20 starts in the big leagues, right? It feels like, I mean, since he's been up and down last year, he made the big league roster this year. Yes, he's 2-10. and a 4-2-4 ERA. The stuff is nasty. The stuff can be figured out. 108 strikeouts in 91 innings, but 43 walks. The control is going to be the big thing to look out for for Aaron Ashby today. He has faced the Cubs a couple of times this year, both times at Wrigley. Combined in those two games, he has gone seven and two-thirds innings. He's allowed eight hits, only two runs. They're both earned runs, three walks, and 13 strikeouts. 12 of those 13 strikeouts, though, came in game two of the doubleheader back on May 30th when he went six strong innings against the Cubs, 12 Ks in six frames, career high in strikeouts for him. What's going to really help Aaron Ashby is the Cubs are a team that whiff a ton. Think about how much uh, Corbin Burns has made them pay over the last few years. Aaron Ashby with those 12 strikeouts earlier in the season. I'm pulling up the league le- league leaders uh, as a team for whiff rate and things of that nature. The Cubs currently have the fifth highest whiff rate as a team in all of baseball. 27% whiff rate. League average is 25%. As for their actual swing rate, do they swing more than most teams? They're in the top half of that. They're not near the very top. They're just just past league average. But what I also see with the Cubs is their chase rate is very high too. Their chase rate's at 28.5. Actually, that's right at league average, so I stand corrected there. What I'm getting at is Ashby's stuff could match up well with what the Cubs do as an offense. They swing and miss a lot. They aren't, you know, they're league average when it comes to chasing. But Ashby's stuff is so nasty that he can be in or around the zone. I trust he can get in zone swings and misses because his stuff is that good. If you want to dive in, to the really advanced stuff on Baseball Savant and on fan graphs. Click along with me and come along for the ride. Looking at the plate discipline profile for Aaron Ashby. Here in 2022, his zone swing rate is 57%, which is actually vastly lower 
than what the the Major League League average is. Major League League average is 67%. So he's 10 points lower than average as far as opponents just swinging, whether they make contact or not, on pitches that are inside the zone. It's because of how many breaking balls he throws. But yet, when you look at his overall whiff rate, it's 30%, which is really, really good. Their zone contact rate is 80%, which is just about league average. If, if Ashby can locate that slider lower third of the zone, get the ground balls or the swings and misses. The change has been a really effective pitch. He's not going to face, he actually is looking to face a, probably a lot of righties in this game, given the Cubs kept Ian Happ, switch hitter, Wilson Contreras, right-handed hitter, Patrick Wisdom, right-handed hitter, Nick Madrigal, right-handed hitter. Their main pieces are righties. And Ashby's going to have to figure out a way to get these righties out. And the changeups, what I'm going to look to, and of course the slider, I wonder how shy he is going to be on his sinker because righties haven't really had trouble with his sinker at all this year. Yes, he gets ground balls on it, but righties are hitting 282 against his primary fastball, that sinking fastball. Keep an eye out for that, but yet his whiff rate on the slider against righties is 39%. I don't want to get too lost in the sauce here for you. This is a podcast, but this is the kind of stuff that I'm looking at ahead of a start and what we're getting onto the air and what we're talking about pregame and on the show and things of that nature. Uh, so Aaron Ashby gets a start. He'll be going up against Keegan Thompson, a right-hander. Keegan this season comes in with a 9-5 and record, a 3.67 ERA. He's a homegrown guy for the Cubs. He's been something, someone they're very excited about, former Auburn Tiger, third-round pick back in 2017. Uh, he last pitched against the uh, Pirates, or excuse me, against the Reds uh, just uh, on Sunday. He went only an inning and two-thirds. He allowed two hits, four runs, three walks, two strikeouts. That's on the heels of having six strong innings against the Nationals. But when he faced the Cardinals earlier in August, he gave up 10 hits and two home runs. He doesn't generally walk a million guys, but he will give up contact. So keep that in mind as you're getting ready to see Keegan Thompson get the ball this afternoon. Again, a 120 first pitch as the Brewers and Cubs get ready for a big three-game set coming up. This series, in my opinion, and I'll wrap up the show with this. I've made this analogy already that it feels like a trap series. That's kind of looking at it low-key. You just have to, if it's a 2-1 and one series, it's a 2-1 and one series. Brewers, the priority is winning series at this point. And especially winning series against teams that you know you're better than. And kudos to the Cubs. They have had the Brewers number all season long. The Cubs... The Brewers are under 500 against Chicago. They're only 6 and 7 this season against the Cubbies. They get to see Marcus Stroman tomorrow, and then they'll see a lefty coming up in the finale on Sunday with Justin Steele on the mound, and we know how the Brewers feel about lefties. The Brewers need to win 2 out of 3. If they go 3 and 0, sweet, awesome. I don't care how they go 2 out of 3, but they need to win 2 out of 3. They're going to show you what they're made of. It's always some juice. There's always some activity going on, and you're going to be dealing with uh, the air show happening this weekend down there in Chicago. Stay mentally tough. You're going to hear the jet sounds flying all over. We had that just here a couple of weeks ago, so that was fun too. I'm stoked. This is going to be so much fun. I'm excited to be down at Wrigley. Uh, I do not have pods, obviously, tomorrow or Sunday. Next podcast on here will come on Monday, but don't fret. I don't take days off. Tomorrow's Brewers Extra Innings will be with Greg Matzik. So Friday, I'll just be there. Saturday, I have Brewers Extra Innings live after the game on Saturday. And then Sunday, I have Brewers Extra Innings as well. So you'll still get your podcast fix just over with our friends at 620 WTMJ. So make sure you tune in post game for those contests as well. And then we we'll write back here for Lockdown Brewers on Monday morning. Thank you for listening. Follow our show account at Lockdown Brewers. Leave a comment on YouTube if you're watching there. Uh, tell your friends. Leave a review. I mean... Pennant race baseball is coming. People are going to want their Brewers fix that haven't maybe they've tuned out a little bit ago or they need to jump back in. Bring them on in. We're, we're a welcoming family around here. Let's have some fun, all right? Uh, enjoy the weekend. Stay safe. And uh, hope to see you at Wrigley. Let's make some noise, Brewers fans, all right? Let's have some fun. Uh, thanks again for listening. Be right back here on Monday. In the meantime, catch me on 620 WTMJ this weekend. Until next time, keep on swinging. You are locked on Brewers. Your daily Milwaukee Brewers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.